Thank you very much. Um, I know you're all still in the middle of a lovely lunch and finishing up uh, your dessert, uh, but I would like to take this wonderful opportunity to introduce your keynote speaker. My name is Chris Ward. I'm with a company called Dragados, but I had the pleasure of working in the Bloomberg administration as well as being the executive director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and a longtime colleague of your luncheon speaker. Um, you know, I was here this morning and you look around the room, I could easily detail Jeanette Sadekhan's enormous accomplishments. Her footprint is left throughout New York, um, but I'm not going to do that. Um, what I'd rather do is give you a little bit of insight into Jeanette and the reasons for her success and leave you with some ideas of <clears throat> how you work in city government, um, particularly in the city of New York. Um, obviously, the myriad programs that Jeanette developed, the bike program stands out as perhaps a, a singular achievement. And people will talk about what that really meant and what it took to put it together. And people will talk about the difficulty with financing. People will talk about the difficulty with <coughs> citing the bike program. People will talk about the software. But for those of us who live and work in New York, for me, the incredible achievement that Jeanette realized was in the face of two tabloids, the Post and the Daily News, who were literally at her door like wolves waiting for one, the slightest hint of fear or the slightest hint that this might not be a success. And in the face of that, many other transportation commissioners would have paused, would have reflected and wondered, do I want to be the subject of a savage caricature on the cover of the New York Post? Do I, do I need my name to be dragged through double entendres, innuendos that would have gone on for months? But Jeanette, in the face of that, stuck to it, persevered through all of those challenges. And believe me, you could feel the tabloids ready to go. And I'm sure they had lined up the artists and they am sure they've lined up all of the headline writers. Um, and they were never able to unleash that attack because Jeanette was strong, she was a leader, and she got that program done. And I think, um, to me, for someone who's been subject to some of the similar tabloid response in New York, that was a singular achievement. Um, and Jeanette and I go back quite a ways. When we were both worked early on in the Dinkins administration, Mayor Dinkins was the first African American elected in the city of New York um, with a broad mosaic as he described it and required a lot of endorsements from elected officials. And one elected official was Congressman Jerry Nadler. And Jeanette at the time was head of the mayor's office of transportation. And I had recently been appointed a title of the Economic Development Corporation's Transportation and Commerce. And Jeanette and I had met before, but I'd never really fully appreciated what it was going to be like to go through the bureaucratic infighting to see who would get to do the EIS on Jerry Nadler's rail freight tunnel. Um, and we fought viciously because this was the prize. You know, this is Mayor Dinkins has endorsed the rail freight tunnel. Jerry Nadler, Congressman Jerry Nadler, his vision for a Brooklyn waterfront was a chance to be realized. And I remember going over to um, now the Tui Courthouse and battling it out with Jeanette. And the great thing is, is she lost and I won. <laughs> and I have been saddled with Jerry Nadler's rail freight tunnel for my entire career. So I was chatting at lunch. If you want to go through the logistics and the justification for rail freight in New York, I have hours to spend with you. Jeanette wisely lost that battle <laughs> and was able to use all of that energy to do far more productive things for the city of New York. Um, but through all of those great accomplishments, Jeanette does have some regrets. Um, and they need to be understood because it's the balance of who she is. And one of Jeanette's great regrets was that she was unable to participate in one of the great exchange programs between the city of New York and the city of Amsterdam, where a group of us were able to go over to Amsterdam and spend four or five days and really study all of the things that makes Amsterdam great. And let me tell you that I and my colleagues were studying Amsterdam till 4, 4.30 in the morning. There were things that Amsterdam revealed at those morning hours that you can't imagine. Um, and Jeanette, unlike, unfortunately, was back home, much like Cinderella, wondering how come everybody else is over in Amsterdam having so much fun, because we burned the candle at both ends for four days straight. Um, but we missed her there. So 
Seriously, seriously, let me, let me end with, from someone from New York, and Polly Trottenberg here was talking about it also. <clears throat> New York is somewhat stuck in the idealized past that we talk about, you know, Robert Moses, and we talk about Austin Tobin, and we have this wonderful sort of idealized, gauzy sense of nostalgia of the great city. But cities remake themselves all the time, um, and they do it regularly, and they do it with intelligence, they do it with firm grit, and they end up becoming a renaissance city that they are today, such as New York, such as San Francisco. And so when people talk about what makes New York the great city that it is today, it stands on the shoulders of Jeanette Sadek Khan. So please give a warm welcome to your speaker. You know, when Chris was saying that he was going to be um, introducing me, he was, you know, he mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, I got worried because we actually have a really long history. Uh, and there's a, a lot of stories there. And so he said, so what do you want me to say? And I said, I just want you to lie. <laughs> and clearly, <laughs> we have a successful uh, introductory speaker. Um, and so I just want to say to Chris, um, thank you. Um, Chris is actually uh, very understated in what he's done in New York City, you know, run the port, uh, run uh, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, in New York City, knows everything that has to do with ports, you know, including longshoremen. Uh, he's got a really salty vocabulary uh, that I uh, urge you to check out uh, during your time here. Um, but he is also, one of the things that's amazing about uh, Chris and, uh, is that he he's a, uh, was a Jesuit priest in training. Um, and he brings a kind of spiritual grace uh, to the conversations that we have on infrastructure in New York, which is no mean uh, feat. You know, very difficult to bring the kind of poetry uh, of, of infrastructure. And so we're really fortunate to have somebody that's so strong uh, and such a visionary uh, as part of uh, the transportation family, not only in New York City, but now in his work with Gregados uh, around the world. So, um, thank you, Chris, for that. Uh, I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time today uh, uh, talking about where we are in NACTO and uh, where we've come. And it is fabulous to be here at this uh, third Design in Cities conference. And I really want to give a big thanks to Ed Reskin, uh, and his team for the conference, and all of the NACDO members uh, that made this conference happen today. So raise your hand if you're a NACDO member. Let's give a big round of applause to the NACDO <laughs> leadership and team. And also, we're going to do a big shout out to our executive director, Linda Bailey, because we are fortunate. <laughs> we're so fortunate to have such a smart, effective, passionate leader. And whether it is deciphering the latest federal uh, rulemaking guidance, you know, which is a, a trick, uh, or overseeing the urban street design and bikeway design guides, um, or organizing the NACDO board and member cities to become a, a really powerful voice um, at the city, at the state, at the federal level, um, or recruiting top flight staff like Corinne Kisner, like Matt Rowe, uh, and like our new uh, hire, Sky Duncan, uh, it's terrific. And I think NACDO is a force in transportation uh, because of her enthusiasm and her dedication and her street smart. So please join me in another big hand for Linda. <laughs> so we are gathered here at a really important moment in time. Um, our cities are growing, and we need to build them differently. And building more roads, as we all know, to accommodate more cars just has not worked. And we are not going to uh, be able to double-deck our roads without doubling uh, our problems and killing you know, life on the very streets that we're trying to save. And our streets have really taken on a much deeper importance given the global challenges that cities face, whether it's climate change, sustainability, population growth, um, all of these challenges. And, you know, uh, as you all know, over half the world's population now lives in cities, and, and it, that number is going to grow to 70% uh, in the next 40 years. So the, the choices that we make today 
about how we prioritize our streets has implications not only for the millions of people that are in our cities today, but it has worldwide uh, implications uh, for generations to come. And it's already clear in the US that we're not gonna be driving our way into that future. The number of vehicle miles traveled uh, has fallen dramatically. It's at its lowest level uh, in 20 years. And at the same time that people are driving less, uh, they're jumping on bikes. And you've seen an explosive growth uh, in bike share. Uh, and it's becoming a really important mode of transportation. How many of you have bike share in your cities? Wow, <laughs> look at that. I mean, that's extraordinary. You know, five years ago, you would not you know, see that kind of widespread uh, adoption. And so you're seeing it. And you know that people are looking for new transportation choices uh, for getting around, Uber and Lyft and uh, uh, car share services. They're becoming the norm. You know, people want to get around without the burden of owning a car. And you know, we need to adapt to this new reality, uh, to this new technology. And planners really need to uh, uh, catch up to this. And it's not really just about new software. Uh, it's also about legacy hardware. And you know, our cities share uh, a common history, a kind of outdated legacy. Uh, our 20th century street design has really focused on moving cars as fast as possible. Uh, and it's missed all of the other ways that a street is used. And you can see that in Times Square in the 1950s. You can see that in Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn in the 1920s. You can see it on Woodward Avenue in Detroit in the 1930s. Uh, you can see it in downtown Toronto. And you know the invasion of the city by the automobile didn't just happen, right? Not just magically just came out of nowhere. It happened by design. And not so long ago, biking and walking was dismissed as this kind of European, uh, it's too European for American cities, right? We can't really go there. Um, but you know, guess where the, the modernist uh, car-oriented street came from. Uh, this is uh, Corbusier's Plan Voisin. And you can also see it in uh, the planning documents for New York City. I love this. Look at these planning documents. First step, <laughs> pedestrians are removed. And then cars invade, right? That's our planning document. So quite, quite something, you know? I guess you, you know, it's, it's kind of like Venice, but with traffic sewers instead of <laughs> canals. So, um, you know, and these kinds of streets were featured, featured in, in places like the 1939 World's Fair. This was the uh, Futurama exhibit in Queens. Uh, and it was also featured in um, uh, Life magazine, this big glossy magazine, these kinds of designs. You know, and, and fabulous future, right? But what, what do we, what's missing from this picture? People, <laughs> people, no people. So, you know, streets are the most valuable asset, one of the most valuable assets a city has. Um, but our street design just hasn't taken into account um, how people actually want to use them. And all of this dysfunction has somehow become uh, part of the accepted streetscape. We have become used to these streets that are, that are out of balance. And you know, pedestrians have been forced to the margin with these car-focused strategies on, with the signalization and the mar markings and the regulations and, and the laws. And you know, 50 years later, not that much had changed. But you know, whether it's with new bus systems or with new bike systems, safer streets that accommodate everyone or, or public space that actually brings back public life, um, in city after city, we're seeing new strategies uh, that, and that are creating new choices and they don't cost billions of dollars and they don't take decades uh, to implement. Uh, it's just about making better use of our existing infrastructure. And what I found in New York uh, was that people were really hungry uh, for public space and for new ways to get around and for safe streets that connected neighborhoods uh, instead of dividing them. And I'm really happy uh, that Polly Trottenberg is here, uh, the new uh, DOT commissioner uh, for New York City has done uh, great work uh, in building on this legacy and, and taking it to new levels. And it's not just in New York. You know, you're seeing people around the country and around the world with this pent up desire 
to reclaim their streets, uh, like here in Los Angeles. You know, and your work in your cities, in the NACDO cities, is um, tapping into that desire. And we're translating real world experience in places like San Francisco uh, into guidance for anyone uh, who wants to transform their streets. Taking a wide open street like this one uh, in Brooklyn that looks like an airport tarmac, you know? I mean, look at that thing. You know, it's like, gentlemen, start your engines. We're really about to, to throttle out. You know, and it was a speedway at night, and it was dangerous for people to cross uh, during the day. You know, and with not a lot, you know, we turned it into a leafy neighborhood street, you know, building in bike lanes, a planted median, uh, parking for residents, uh, and also calmed the traffic there. And you can see this project translated uh, into the NACDO street design guide with specifications and, and blueprints uh, for cities to use uh, in their own contexts. Here's another example uh, of a real world experience uh, represented in plan view uh, for other cities to use uh, to meet their own needs. And you know, the need for this new guidance is, is clear. Before uh, NACDO did the uh, bikeway uh, design guide, uh, you know, we had examples from around the world, uh, but we had nothing uh, that showed how we could transform uh, streets in the US. For example, you know, this, you know, our existing guidance said that you know, this protected bike facility in Europe um, was simply unacceptable on uh, American streets. But this was okay. Uh, this white line on the side of the road, perfectly fine. And so the message was that our existing highway and street network was perfectly sufficient uh, for biking. And obviously, you know, there was a huge gap in our guidance. And as many of you know, um, the bike design guide filled that gap and provided cities with a template that they could use uh, to, that was based on the emerging best practices um, from all of you. And drawing on real world experience, it set the stage for other cities to follow. Uh, to take uh, streets like this, you know, these chaotic streets, it basically said the message here was, you know, bike at your own risk. And we turned them into you know, uh, pedestrian, bike, and uh, car safe corridors. With projects like the Market Street cycle track, you know, here in San Francisco, uh, were turned into standard treatments that spoke the language of design guidance using uh, things like, you know, this is required, this is recommended, optional treatment components, and, you know, citing precedent and uh, results uh, and existing guidance. Uh, Portland certainly led the way. Uh, with in the country with um, bike boulevards, which are a really great complement to protected bike networks, especially uh, for families. Uh, and you can see the resulting design guidance that came from uh, Portland and, and other member cities. You know, and we've seen these designs spread like wildfire uh, since 2009. Um, and in 2010, when we released the guide, um, uh, the kind of protected bike lanes that we've seen really, you, they were a rare breed. Um, and now you can see that they are found all over the country. Um, we launched some of the first new designs in New York City, and you now see these kinds of new bike infrastructure facilities all over the country, um, from Washington, D.C., uh, to Chicago, to Seattle, and Austin, which now has some great new bike infrastructure. Hey, Austin's over there, huh? Excellent. <laughs> Feel free to root for your city as it's coming up. <laughs> and so here we go with Atlanta. Anybody here from Atlanta? Okay. Atlanta, woo! <laughs> Got some new great infrastructure going there. Uh, there we go. You know, and cities are leveraging this investment in bike infrastructure with new bike share systems. You know, we launched uh, New York City's uh, bike share system on Memorial Day last year. Uh, and we have 6,000 bikes, 330 stations, the largest in North America, uh, and uh, it was really a, a banner day. It really was a banner day. Uh, I will tell you, though, um, uh, on the day that we launched, it's, it, it's kind of hairy. You know, Chris points out, you know, the tabloids and all of you that are involved in innovative changes. It's scary sometimes when you're trying these new things. You don't know if they're going to work. And I remember the day that we launched this, you know, walked over with the mayor from City Hall, and, you know, the press office had suggested that I actually uh, do the key, uh, in case it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and the mayor was like, no, 
I'm doing it. Because um, if it doesn't work for me, you know, then it's not going to work for the 8.4 million people uh, that need to use it. And um, so the press secretary to the mayor was just like completely freaked out. Because <laughs> we walk over and they're like, 50 cameras that are there, you know, at the bike share station in City Hall, as, as Paula would know. And we're standing there, and the mayor, you know, you know, sometimes technology works, sometimes it doesn't. So he puts, you know, he's got the little key thing, and, and, and he, you know, swipes it, and I, all of the pictures, I'm standing there like this, just praying to God. <laughs> Fortunately, it worked, and in 16 months, uh, people have taken uh, 13 million rides. They've ridden 22 million miles, 880 times around the Earth. I work for a data-driven guy, and so he was all about the data. And so I can tell you that in the process, they've burned off 1.6 million Big Macs. <laughs> Do what you can. City bike is so popular that the real estate industry has really taken notice. And now you can, you know, you pick up any kind of real estate listing and it will tell you uh, the proximity that an apartment has uh, to a city bike station. So after our success with the bike design guide, we turned uh, our eyes to an even bigger target, the overall design of our streets. And, and from the start, there was a recognition among member cities that it wasn't just all about the bikes, that um, it was about designing better streets. And you know, while cities around the country, Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, Charlotte, uh, had had their own uh, design guides, there was no uh, national equivalent. Uh, and so we codified these innovative design practices into this new operating code for cities. Uh, and I want to give a shout out, actually, uh, you know, this had not been adopted uh, by any state departments of transportation. And uh, Lynn Peterson, uh, who is the secretary for Washington State DOT, I don't know if Lynn is here. There's Lynn. And she adopted it. So it was the first day to state DOT to adopt the NACTO guide. And you know, it really gave a permission slip to cities uh, to innovate who were uh, either scared to do so or really didn't have the resources to uh, research state-of-the-art practice. And the, this street in Brooklyn, I think, embodies some of the new design uh, philosophy uh, that we have about designing for people and not just cars. You know, this is a street that looked like a junkyard uh, for cars uh, in Dumbo. And you know, over a weekend, we turned it into a plaza that's become you know, a neighborhood centerpiece and an anchor for the local businesses. You know, and it's really just for the cost of paint and planters, you can really transform these places in real time. This, we did this in 2008 in Madison Square. We just put out the oran orange barrels, and people just you know, they just came. And you know, the, here they were just sketching, uh, not even with any tables and chairs. That's how starving we are for public space in New York. Um, and we did it in a variety of contexts. You remember this picture of um, Times Square in the 50s? Today it is a pedestrian oasis and an economic powerhouse that's actually worthy of its name as the crossroads of the world. And using inexpensive materials, we tipped the balance in favor uh, of pedestrians. And you can use these building blocks uh, in new ways, whether it's fixing a tangle of traffic that you see here uh, on Delancey Street at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge where we had uh, nine people killed over five years, um, 742 people injured, and using paint and planters and barriers, um, we were able to fix it and make a more walkable, bikeable crossing for thousands of New Yorkers that used it every day. Um, or take a neglected tangle, uh, triangle of concrete in Philly and reconnect it to the curb, reconnect it to the neighborhood, uh, and create a thriving uh, public plaza. Uh, and <laughs> when Los Angeles reassigns space from cars, uh, you know that there's a seismic shift uh, underway. And you can see this on Broadway uh, right now, uh, thanks to the leadership of Salita Reynolds, the new commissioner, and you know that's recognizing the opportunities that are hidden in plain sight. And the NACTO guide takes the best from all of these uh, street projects and creates a new playbook. Uh, taking real life projects like this seven lane traffic free for all in New York, uh, which was transformed into a street that serves uh, all users. And then converting it into a set of principles uh, for how to get from before to after. And cities like Atlanta are taking it one step further and showing how walking and biking and transit can play well together if you don't make them fight over the scraps. 
Here's another great example in Austin with a, I love this, this floating bus stop uh, that protects the bike lane. Uh, and you know, the guide is about making big streets work too, uh, making better use of space like this one uh, in the Bronx, which became a rapid bus corridor with dedicated bus lanes uh, and uh, camera enforced lanes to keep cars out uh, and let people pay before they got on the bus. And so, as all of you know, it takes political leadership to go from plans to streets. And we accomplished a lot under Mayor Bloomberg's leadership. Uh, and we're seeing that kind of leadership in action now all over the country. Um, the mayors in your cities understand the importance of designing world-class streets. So with the success of NACDO's design guide, uh, we're starting to see projects uh, on the ground that are a new world order, kind of a new road order uh, on the streets. Uh, one that puts people at the top of the street pyramid. And it's sorely needed, not only here, but in cities around the world. And cities are struggling with the same challenges that we face here. Um, and the problems are rooted in the same outdated highway design standards. And you know we can change that. We can uh, uh, build on our work and we can take it to the next level. And you know the problem the problems are familiar, you know, streets without safe crossing, uh, sidewalks that are colonized by cars, or streets that have no sidewalks at all. 1.2 million people die every year around the world uh, on our streets. It is a global public health crisis. So today, I'm happy to announce that NACTO is launching a global street design project that will spread the principles of better street design to a global audience, uh, thanks to a grant from the Bloomberg Road Safety Partnership. And we know a lot from our work in the United States, uh, but we also want to take a look at models uh, from other places. And we're going to look at a variety of typologies around the world and strategies that grow the communal fabric uh, that ties us all together. And we're also gonna take a look at new metrics that go beyond the usual you know, traffic volumes and travel speeds. And we're going to take a look at new metrics, uh, general mo mobility, public health, uh, you know, environmental quality, quality of life, safety. So the street of the future, a street that is safe, a street that is accessible, that is attractive, for billions of people is not going to design itself. And waiting for it isn't a strategy. It's gonna take the creativity of every person in this room to find the opportunities that are hidden on every street. And it's gonna take your courage to claim it and redesign it. And it's your leadership that will make that happen. We started down a new road and there's no going back. Thank you all. <laughs>